So good morning to all of you. Welcome. Welcome to the guests that we have this morning. There are a few, I see. Uh, we are glad that you could join us here in Abbotsford for worship. And we also welcome anyone joining us by the live feed this morning. May the Lord bless us all as we submit to his word and worship him in his glory. There is one announcement, and that is that we have this meeting planned this week between council and congregation. That's for Wednesday, April 10, at 7.30 in this building. That's the only announcement. The call to worship this morning is from Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. If you are able, please now rise for worship. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation, where does our help come from? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Receive also the greeting of our God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 50 in connection with the sermon this morning on Proverbs, the Psalms that we've chosen have uh, a connection to wisdom and knowledge of the Lord and God speaking to us. So Psalm 50 is our first selection, stanzas one and two. give our attention now to the Ten Commandments. These Ten Commandments, we read them almost first thing every service, and they take our minds and hearts to a space where we are aware of our sinfulness and our need for God's grace so that we approach God that way, needful of his grace and also filled with gratitude for his grace. So let's read the commandments with that in mind, and then We'll read a brief section from the letter to James, and then we'll sing Psalm 119, 55, and 56. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Reflecting on this further, I'd like to read with you from the letter of James. Our focus today is on the book of Proverbs and in the New Testament, the book that really speaks to us of wisdom is the letter of James. So hence a selection from there this morning after the law. For chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Let's sing Psalm 119, 55 and 56. Let's pray together. Our Father who is in heaven, you are the almighty and eternal God, the creator of heaven and earth, 
You sent your Son to be our Savior, and by his death and resurrection, he has defeated sin and Satan and delivered us. You, Father, are worthy of all praise and glory and majesty. And that is why at the end of Psalm 50, the part that we sung, there was the exclamation, may all fear you. The fear of you is something on our minds this morning, Father, as we turn to the book of Proverbs and read the wisdom there. We find there that the fear of the Lord is the beginning, the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So it is right and proper that we, the creatures, fear the Creator. And by fear, Lord, we do not mean that we are afraid as such, although you are in that sense very much fearful. But it is more, Father, that we understand how small we are, how great you are, how infinite. And we feel in our hearts a proper response of reverence and awe so that we treat your name properly and with respect, and so that, Father, we follow your ways and commands, and we speak of you and to you in the proper way. We pray, Father, that those things may be true of us, and we ask that knowing that often they are not. It is often not true of us that we fear you as we should. Too often we fear other things more. We are more afraid of the people around us, their ideas or viewpoint of us, their reaction to us, than we are afraid of your reaction to our decisions, words, and choices. We pray for your forgiving grace, that you will wash away also this sin, along with all of our sins, so that we can be clean and accepted before you, we can know ourselves to be your children through faith in Jesus Christ. That is, Father, the truth that gives us so much joy whenever we gather together in response to your call. We come here knowing that we are your children, and we are together with your family, all your other adopted children. Thank you, Lord, for this grace to us that you have made us your own, you have given us your name, you have given us the promise of a future inheritance as a father does to his sons and daughters. Father, indeed, worship, the official gathering for worship each and every Sunday is a time of joy for us, a time for us to worship the God that we fear, but also to be blessed and encouraged by his grace and love. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and love towards us. We ask your blessing over all that is done here in this hour. We pray that your word, as we read it, may reach into our hearts. And then as we listen to it being proclaimed and explained and applied, may we take it even deeper. May your spirit work in us and among us. And may our response of praise, of prayer, of offering, may that be acceptable to you and bring you, Father, joy in the children that you have chosen and are renewing. Father, all that we do is done in weakness and with shortcomings. May it still be pleasing to you. And may it please you, Father, also to bless those who uh, join by the live feet, who can't be with us in person, but are nevertheless part of us. May they also, Father, experience your blessing and know themselves to be part of the family of God through faith. Will you hear our prayer? and accept our thanksgiving, not because we deserve it, but for Jesus' sake. Amen. So this morning we continue our series of sermons on the books of the Bible. Uh, we took quite a break because we had Advent, and then we had Christmas, and then we had some time spent in the Gospels leading up to Easter. But now we have the opportunity to come back to it. When we left off, we had just had a sermon on Psalms, so that means that today we pick up our series with Proverbs. And uh, to introduce us to the book of Proverbs this morning, we'll read the opening introductory verses in chapter 1, 
So chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll skip ahead to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really where what we think of typically as the book of Proverbs, these, this list of sayings sort of randomly organized, touching on all parts of life. That's where that actually begins in chapter 10. So as a kind of a sample, we will read the verses 1 through 14 there. So starting in Proverbs chapter 1, the verses 1 through 7, verse 7 later will be our text. Listen to the word of God. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then turning to chapter 10, we'll read the verses 1 through 14. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. So far, our reading of God's word. Let's now sing of, from Psalm 49, stanzas 1 and 5.
text for the preaching this morning is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and this is our window into the book of Proverbs, what God teaches us there. This verse reads as follows, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, fools despise wisdom and instruction. The theme this morning is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I chose the word wisdom there, even though the text uses the word knowledge, but the two are synonyms. And uh, for us, wisdom is maybe more uh, the known word and more commonly used to summarize what we are learning in the book of Proverbs. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <clears throat> Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, here in Abbotsford, we continue our series this morning, as I said, on the books of the Bible. And our next book is Proverbs. Proverbs finds us in the middle of a section of Bible books that includes Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. We've already looked at Job and Psalms. The thing that links these five books, this section, is the topic of wisdom. And this section of the Bible is commonly referred to as wisdom literature. When we started our study of this section, we started with the book of Job, and at that time we made some general comments about wisdom literature, but that was a long time ago already. That's already probably back in no last November. So let me just repeat this morning that wisdom literature is occupied with two main questions. The first question is, what is the good life? That's a phrase you'll hear in the sermon this morning a little bit, the good life. I'll explain more about it in a second. But that's the question, what is the good life? The second question that wisdom literature is occupied by is this. How do we make sense of it when we live the good life, when we choose what is good, but we're not rewarded for it? That's the second thing that the wisdom literature is busy with, and we notice that question particularly, of course, in the book of Job, and Lord willing, that question will be the focus uh, next Sunday morning when we give our attention to the book of Ecclesiastes. The question, what is the good life, is the main preoccupation of Proverbs. So that first question, that's what we're focused on uh, this morning in the book of Proverbs. What is the good life? The opening verses of Proverbs, <clears throat> leading up to our text in verse 7, they address various groups of people with the promise of helping them to live the good life. We find that there is an address to the simple, to the youth, to the wise, and to the understanding. And that's just a sample because this book applies, of course, to all categories of people and social group. The book of Proverbs lays out its intent, which is to assist everybody, all these different groups, with finding the path that will lead to righteousness, justice, and equity, those three terms used in verse 3, to receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity. That's where we're headed. That is the good life, living a life of righteousness Justice and equity is the good life. It means choosing the right thing. And then, as a result, experiencing the blessing that comes from that, the blessed result of having chosen the right thing. Choosing the right thing, being blessed as a result, that is the good life, that is, in a nutshell, wisdom. Now, you and I both know there's a lot of need in this world and in our own lives for this kind of wisdom, isn't there? Choices confront us at every turn. I want the, the children and youth to think about this too. All the choices you make each and every day. And I, I don't mean necessarily like grand choices about where your life is going to go. Just all the little choices you have to make. <clears throat> Should I eat that dessert? that's full of calories or not. Or maybe for the littler ones, when the desserts come around, should I pick the biggest one? 
or maybe I shouldn't. It's a choice you have to make. It doesn't seem like a really big, earth-shattering choice, but it's a choice. For the youths, should I buy a new car? If I buy a car, should I buy a used one? And, and on and on the choices go. Should I wear this outfit or should I pick something more modest? Should I get that chore done now? Should I postpone it till later? Should I go to work straight out of high school or should I invest in some education first? Should I tell this person what I really think or maybe I should keep it to myself? On and on it goes. One choice after another after another. And all of these choices, big or small, they, at some level, do have consequences, don't they? <clears throat> There's a poet who has written about a fork in the road. The road comes to a dividing point. The poem is famously entitled, The Road Not Taken. We don't need to go into detail about the poem. The idea of the poem is that it puts into words the fact that every fork in the road has consequences that you look on, back on maybe later. Sometimes the consequences are significant, other times they're less significant, but every choice matters to a certain extent. And, most importantly, every choice matters to the Lord whom we serve. And wisdom, this good life we are talking about, wisdom is about learning to make the right choice. When that dessert tray comes around, and you see there's one big piece bigger than the others. What's the right choice? What's the good choice? What's the choice that will please the Lord? Wisdom is about learning to make the right choice in big things and in little things. Because making the right choice pleases the Lord. And the Lord who is pleased with us blesses us in Jesus Christ. And all of this leads me to ask you then, to think about yourself and your own choices, all of you. What do you need? What do you need in order to make good choices? Or I could even say, what do you need in order to make better choices? I'll give you some examples of what I mean here. Do you need more self-control? Is it, is it possible that you could use a bit more self-control when you're making decisions so that you can hold yourself back from impulsively choosing the thing that gives you the most immediate pleasure. Maybe that's something you need. Or maybe, when I ask this question, what do you need to make better choices, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I wish that I could kind of see into the future so that I could know which decision to make based on how things will turn out. That would be very helpful. Or maybe you're wishing, maybe you, maybe you think this, maybe you wish you had a, a wise sidekick, someone beside you with lots of wisdom that could kind of steer or guide you through all these decisions. Somebody who could really, when it comes down to, make the decision for you using their wisdom and then absolving you, of course, of the responsibility of making all these choices. What do we need in order to make good choices? I've listed some things, but the Bible and the book of Proverbs says what we need. The Bible and the book of Proverbs gives us actually a list in these verses in Proverbs 1, verse 1 through 7. We find there that we need instruction, insight, prudence, knowledge, discretion, and understanding. It's quite a list of things. And all of those things are words that describe a mind and a heart that is equipped to make good decisions. And all of those things are summed up actually by that word that keeps coming up here, the word wisdom. Instruction, insight, prudence, knowledge, discretion, understanding, that all is the same thing as wisdom. Wisdom is a condition of the mind where it has the tools to make right decisions, decisions that please the Lord and are blessed by Him. Wisdom understands and knows the choice that is put before it. It knows where the person should be headed, and it knows which of those choices will keep that person headed in that direction. This is the purpose of the book of Proverbs, as stated very clearly in its introduction 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. As the book unfolds, as you read it, you find all kinds of advice and all kinds of warnings. A lot of it is laid out in pithy sayings collected by King Solomon starting in chapter 10. We read a sample there, first 14 verses. Solomon was known, actually he was even famous for his wisdom. And he used this wisdom to address all areas of life and all of the Ten Commandments. There are sayings from Solomon about how we should speak, sayings about how we should work, sayings about how to relate to people, sayings about how we should use our money. It's down-to-earth stuff, practical stuff, useful in everyday life. It's wisdom that can help us to make these decisions that we were speaking about a moment ago. And just to be clear, it's not just the book of Proverbs that has this. It is, of course, the whole Bible that is full of wisdom to assist us in making those decisions that seem to come at us one after another. It's just part of our life. We have to make decisions as we go through our path and our journey. The collected wisdom of Proverbs and of the rest of Scripture can guide us, if we let it, so that we do choose what pleases the Lord, what is blessed by Him, and find ourselves then in the good life. Solomon, when he collected this wisdom, did so with the conviction that being wise would lead to blessing. He believed that he was describing the good life. And by the good life, I don't mean, you know, having your feet up, retired by your own swimming pool in the backyard with your RV parked in the front yard. That's not what I mean by the good life. No, I mean that the husband who loves his wife wisely will have a blessed marriage. The youth who makes his career choice wisely, prepares wisely, will have a good living. The person who is wise about keeping a balance of work and play will be healthy. Wisdom leads to happiness and peace. That's what we mean. And that's what Solomon is conveying in the book of Proverbs. And that's the reason that our text also in verse 7 describes the fool. The fool appears quite often in wisdom literature. And you would have noticed also in chapter 10 that several of the Proverbs that we read mention the fool, the babbling fool even. He appears often in wisdom literature as the one who despises wisdom and refuses to be guided in his choices or to consider the consequences of his choices. The fool doesn't think about the good life. He doesn't think about what pleases God. He doesn't think about that blessing of God that he needs. He just only thinks about what he wants in the moment. So when he's hungry, he eats. When he's tired, he goes to sleep. When he's angry, he yells. He's not thinking about whether he will become fat and lazy and have no friends if he keeps eating and sleeping and yelling. That's the fool. And every one of us has some fool inside of them that needs to be dealt with. I say that about everyone because every one of us is a sinner. And every sinner is a fool, and every fool is a sinner. Sin is ultimately an act of foolishness. It's foolish because it makes no sense we choose what we think what will benefit us in the short term at the cost of what we should know will benefit us in the long term. That's just foolish. It doesn't make sense, and yet we do it. And the more we indulge that fool inside of us, the more our life gets off track. We wander off onto trails that lead to pain, that lead to destruction. <clears throat> the more we learn wisdom, however the more through the work of the Holy Spirit as renewed people who belong to the Lord that we are trying to serve, the more we learn wisdom, the more we bottle up that foolishness and suppress it, and we refuse to let it dominate and influence our lives and our choices anymore. The question that confronts us, and, and this is a question that comes to renewed Christians. I want to underline this. We are renewed in Jesus Christ, we belong to the Lord, and we are called to a life of obedience. May I remind you of the form for baptism, which says that we are called and obliged to a new life. That's 
who is being addressed here. And we are being addressed to this question, do you want to have this wisdom? God's wisdom. Do you wish that you had the ability to make good choices? Do you wish that you understood things better? Do you wish that you had more willpower to choose what you know is right? <clears throat> Maybe you even wish you could go back and undo some of the past decisions you've made or make them right in the present. That's where wisdom is a gift to us from our Lord, from our Savior. Wisdom answers all of those questions and it promises blessing as we serve the Lord. Proverbs 22, verse 20 to 22 says this about the blessing that God promises. It says, So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will inherit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Wisdom, blessing, foolishness, destruction. Proverbs 3, verse 13 says something similar. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. It's as plain as day, isn't it? Plain as can be. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. So beautiful. That's what God promises along with the gift of wisdom. It reminds us of the this, this story of Solomon when God said to Solomon, ask me for whatever you want. And Solomon wisely <laughs> asked for wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. And then he gave him everything else he hadn't asked for because that's how wisdom works. Wisdom is the beginning. And that's also in, uh, I just want to point out verse 6 of chapter 10, because we actually read that together. Blessings are on the head of the righteous. Blessings are on the head of the righteous. With wisdom comes God's blessing. He gives you wisdom, and then along with that, through the wisdom that you start to live by, you also receive his blessing. It's amazing. I assume I have convinced you now of the merits of wisdom, rather not I, but Scripture. You want to achieve this wisdom, don't you? And there are two ways, then, that we can go about this, that we want to consider now. Two ways that we can approach this desire to receive wisdom with the book of Proverbs this morning in front of us as our guide. The first way is this, one way to learn the wisdom that we need and that we now are convinced is so important in our life, the first way is to learn this wisdom that has been collected for us. That's the first approach we could try. And by that I mean studying the book of Proverbs and learning what it has to say, memorizing all these sayings, cataloging them and then applying them when you come up with a situation that is relevant. Many people have used the book of Proverbs that way. For example, if you're struggling, struggling with laziness or procrastination, then you could look up chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. There is advice. There is wisdom when we're faced with that decision, do I work hard or do I slack off? So that's, that's one way for us to approach wis uh, this quest for wisdom. I want to say that approaching things this way is not a bad thing. You can do worse than studying this book, catalog cataloging its advice so that you can look it up when you're faced with a problem or a choice. The advice in this book and really throughout the Bible is good and you can't really go wrong if you follow it. Follow it. We all need advice because of the limits and lack in our own knowledge. But, and you probably heard that coming, but there is a better way to use this book and to gain wisdom. 
the way that I've just described to you is more like the way of a child. <clears throat> it's more the way of obedience than of true wisdom. And again, I want to underline that obedience is good. It's good to be obedient, to do what you're told. But wisdom goes beyond that. Wisdom is better. Obedience means that you let someone else tell you what to do. <clears throat> In this case, the way we are speaking, we're letting the Proverbs tell us what to do. When you're a child, that's how you operate. You obey the wise dictates and instructions of your parents. But we're aiming for more than that with the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs as a book is aiming for more than that. This book doesn't present itself as a list of advice for you to obey, to look up, find the verse that you need, and then apply it. No, this book is aiming for wisdom. As you grow up, if we use that example of a child, you stop doing things just because your parents tell you to do it. You start to make your own choices. You're not merely obeying, but you are choosing, which is a different thing. And you're not going based on what other people say is good, but what you have learned for yourself is good. That's wisdom. And that's what the book of Proverbs is aiming for. Your goal is not merely to learn and to memorize the good advice of a book like Proverbs. Your goal is something deeper, something more comprehensive, something more reflective of what we mentioned earlier. Who is this book addressing? God's redeemed children, whom he is renewing by his spirit in the image of his own son, Jesus Christ. The deeper and more comprehensive goal is spelled out very clearly in our text this morning in this introduction to the book of Proverbs where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. That sentence unlocks for us the treasure house of true wisdom and the true purpose of the book of Proverbs. It's from that statement that all the good advice of this book flows and that all the wise sayings arise out of. If you understand verse 7 of chapter 1, then you are on the pathway of wisdom, not merely just the pathway of obedience, but the pathway of wisdom. If you don't understand verse 7, then at best you can be obedient, which is not a bad thing, but you won't be truly wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This statement introduces us to a very important concept, which is the fear of the Lord. It's a concept mentioned in the Bible repeatedly. I just take the book of Psalms as an example this morning. Psalm 2, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear. Psalm 15, verse 4, the righteous man honors those who fear the Lord. Psalm 19, verse 9, the fear of the Lord is pure and enduring forever. This comes up over and over. We had it in Psalm 50, may all fear the Lord, at the end of verse 2. What is this fear of the Lord that is clearly so important in the Bible and apparently is also the goal of the book of Proverbs? Well, the word fear is perhaps a little bit misleading because it makes us think of being afraid, and that's not really the intent here as such. The intent of the word fear in this case is more like awe, being in awe. A person who fears the Lord holds him in reverential awe. In Old Testament times, that would be expressed when coming into the presence of the Lord by falling down on your face. That's the expression you have over and over. Just that was the instinctive reaction of a person coming into the presence of the Lord to just fall down in front of them. A person who fears the Lord, has awe for him, respects the Lord for his power and majesty and divinity. He understands the holiness of God, knows that God upholds the righteous because he himself is so perfectly, thoroughly, rigorously righteous to the extent even that he punishes the wicked because wickedness is an affront to his holiness. If we understand it rightly, the fear of the Lord is an attitude that affects not only our relationship to God himself, but as Proverbs clearly indicates and teaches us, it has an impact on our whole life. The person who fears the Lord realizes 
that his relationship to the Lord is what governs his life. The wicked do whatever they want because, Psalm 36, verse 1, there is no fear of God before their eyes. See the connection there? They don't fear the Lord, so they just do whatever they want. But the righteous who fear the Lord, they let the awe that they feel towards God shape every single decision, whether big or small. And that's where wisdom begins. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It is the beginning of wisdom. The two words are synonymous. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you fear the Lord, then you will be equipped to make good decisions Decisions that please the Lord, that lead to blessing and a good life, and that reflect the state of grace and redemption into which he has called you. If you fear the Lord, you'll do well at school. You'll have a successful marriage. You'll do well in your career. You'll have a good relationship with other people. That's his promise. He says, do things the way that I have taught you, and I will bless you because you are my child in Jesus Christ. It starts with this fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11 verse 3 speaks of a person who delights in the fear of the Lord, delights in having this attitude of awe towards God. Such a person who delights in God that way, he spends his time, her time, thinking Not about what he or she wants, but what God wants. They don't think of their own agenda for this life, but God's agenda for this life. God is the person who matters, the person who deserves glory, the person who knows. There's a saying that I come across often when I study devotional material. Maybe you've heard this saying too. It goes like this. Thinking God's thoughts after him. Ever heard that phrase before? Maybe it's new to you this morning, I'm not sure. But what the saying means, thinking God's thoughts after him, is that the Christian believer tries to make his mind be in sync with God's mind. What God wants, I want. What God thinks is best, I think is best. Where God wants me to go, I want to go. What God thinks is important, I think is important. That's thinking God's thoughts after him. And it comes from fearing him. If you hold God in the highest awe and the highest respect, then his thoughts and ways are the most important. They are the best. They come first. They shape and guide all your decisions. And what could be wiser than that? I invite you to imagine this morning, as we come to our concluding thoughts, how different your decisions would turn out if you made them all only after you attempted to think God's thoughts after him. What does God want me to choose? What does God think is better? And by better, I mean better for me, better for others, better for his kingdom and church, better for his glory. It's not easy, we admit, for a person who is by nature a foolish sinner. That's what we all are by nature before God calls us into his state of grace and redemption and renewal. It's not easy with that natural foolishness in us to realign our thoughts to God's thoughts. But that's why God has given us his Holy Spirit. That's why we emphasize he is addressing people who belong to him. With the power of the Spirit whom we have in Jesus Christ, we can learn to fear the Lord. And we can start to make decisions on that basis. And nothing could be wiser than to make decisions on that basis. God is the source of all life and blessing. When we choose his ways, we are always following the life, way of life and blessing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And that's what the book of Proverbs is about. It's not so much a book of advice. I hope that point was clear. It's not so much a book of advice for you to look up the appropriate verse that you need, follow it, and then get it right. You can use it that way, of course. But it's so much more than that. It's a book about fearing God. 
And really, all these Proverbs are not so much advice. They're, they're more like examples of what it looks like when you do fear the Lord. When you fear the Lord, it looks like this. And that's the idea. The idea is for you to start fearing the Lord. And then you too will start to look like this more and more. Righteous, just, fair, good, wise, and very importantly, blessed. In Jesus Christ, through the work of the Spirit, you'll be taught wisdom and you'll be blessed. Amen. Let's now pray together. Our Father who is in heaven, thank you that you are the awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. You are indeed worthy to be feared, and it is right and proper that we should hold you in the highest awe. We have again been reminded, Lord, how that is not merely an idea, but something very practical. With all the choices that we face in this life as we walk the path you lay before us, what we need is to fear you first of all, for that is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that you give to your people whom you have chosen in Jesus Christ this precious gift of wisdom, and that with wisdom we can live and experience the good life. And by that we mean not a life full of earthly treasures, but a life full of blessing and peace as we choose what is good, as we choose righteousness, justice, equity. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit working this wisdom into us as something that goes deeper than mere obedience. It is something instead, Father, that comes from a living relationship with you. We pray, Father, that as we grow, we may be able to leave behind the ways of a child and instead come into mature ways that we may still be obedient, but instead that obedience may come from the choices we make that we make in view of the awe that we feel for you. Lord, teach us indeed to know your majesty and holiness and to put that first in our lives with every choice we make. Help us to think your thoughts after you as you have revealed them to us in your word. In all of this, Father, we know that we fall short. We pray that we may grow in this more and more that we more and more may give evidence that we are the people you have declared us to be, that is, your children, renewed in the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is perfectly wise and who is the one who teaches us this wisdom through his Spirit. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's now sing Psalm 90, stanzas 1, 6, and 8. <laughs>
us pray our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Our Father who is in heaven, we have spoken this morning about your blessing upon the people who serve you and walk in your ways. Thank you, Lord, that we experience that blessing in our lives in so many ways. Not that there aren't trials and difficulties. We indeed still also face and experience the brokenness of this life. There is illness, there is sadness, there is grief and loss, there is pain. All of these, Father, are experienced in varying degrees by your people here in Abbotsford too. We think of those who struggle because of this. Uh, right now, we think especially of our brother Peter Olai and his family, including his wife Margaret. They are going through a process of recovery after surgery recently. And with that, Father, comes ups and downs, pain, impatience. And we pray, Father, that you will uphold our brother and sister and their family through this process that you will give strength and healing and recovery so that Peter can back, get back to where he was after the previous surgery. He was doing so well. We pray, Father, that that may come again. But that is an example, Lord, of, of the kinds of things we face in this broken life. And yet, apart from that, Father, there is still much for us to be thankful for and to rejoice in. As we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. You are near to us, and you give us joy and peace in many ways. And we thank you for this, for the blessing that you give, along with the wisdom that you teach us. We give thanks, Father, for the food we eat, and for the sleep we enjoy, and for the houses we live in, and for the work that we are able to do, and for the fellowship we enjoy. This morning, we have planned also a time of fellowship after the service. It is so good, Lord, to be together, to share our faith, share our presence with one another, and just to encourage each other that way. We give thanks for this among many of your other blessings. And we realize, Father, that none of it is earned. It is your gracious gift to us. Lord, we want to celebrate some of your blessings that are um, being marked with milestones this coming week. We remember our sister Jenny Decker with her birthday. Thank you that you've been with her in the past year, giving her health and strength still. We pray that you will continue to be with her in the year ahead, that you will walk with her and be near to her. We pray similar things for our sister uh, Dorothy Sigma. Thank you that you have given her also this week a milestone a birthday to celebrate. We pray for you to continue to bless her so that she can continue to be a blessing to those around her. And we remember the Brants, our brother and sister, who recently have yeah, been through some health struggles, experienced some of that brokenness we spoke of a moment ago, but are still this week able to celebrate a uh, significant milestone, a wedding anniversary, 64 years. Lord, you have been so good to them through all the ups and downs. You have kept them together to encourage one another and support and assist each other. We pray that that may continue to be as they go forward. And um, we ask that you be with them in the coming year of their married life together. Lord, we thank you for these kinds of milestones that remind us of how full our life is of your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon the church community and family here and we can uh, yeah, sort of review and commemorate those things this week in our annual meeting where we have the reports of the committees that have been busy on our behalf and we can also review the finances. You have uh, ble uh, blessed us richly to maintain the, the building and the ministry here. We thank you for this, and we thank you for the opportunity to come together and celebrate and review it all. Lord, we ask that you teach us gratitude. That too is part of the path of wisdom, that we remember to give thanks to you. It's a way also that we show that we fear you, that we give you the honor and respect and worship that is due to you. Lord, indeed, teach us to fear your name, to be people who hold you in awe, who worship you, who put you first and above all other things. 
we, Father, can amass the treasures of this life, but there is no greater treasure than the covenant you have made with us, the presence, your own presence, you have made known to us, and the Savior that you have given to us. These are truly our treasures. Lord, bless us as this day unfolds, a day of rest, that we may be refreshed for the tasks you call us to, and hear our prayer, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God with our offering. The collection this morning is for the work of the deacons, and then we will sing from Psalm 111, stanzas 1 and 5. Receive now the blessing of your Lord and go in his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Mm -hmm.